Welcome again to the Emissary Publishing Authors Podcast. My name is Paul Edwards, and it's a pleasure to have with me my partner in crime and my friend and my colleague, Jason Todd. And uh, Jason, we got an exciting episode this week. We're bringing on a dear friend of mine who has pub written and published uh, at least half a dozen books. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the author who follows through. I like that concept. What do you have to say? Well, uh one of the things I'm super excited about hearing in this episode is what is it like to publish multiple books? I, so many people have such a hard time getting to their first book, much less getting over that hump of their first book. And the, you know, the topic of following through is certainly an important one if you're going to publish many books. But one of the things I'm keen on listening to is why, why, uh, why publish so many books? What is it about you? So let's yeah. welcome Evan Money onto the show. Evan, welcome, buddy. Excited to be here. Looking forward to reaching the top tier of podcasts. And, you know, I've been working my way up and finally got to Emissary Publishing and just super excited to be here. Well, we're excited to hear your story. I know that you and Paul go back uh, some ways here. Oh, yes. Paul and I have a great, great journey. And it was actually, I met Paul through a podcast of all things. So I think it's appropriate to share the real version of the story. Paul <laughs> has the inaccurate version of the story. Uh, it so happened that I was listening to a podcast and I heard Paul, I heard Paul speak and it was the voice of God. And I was like, Hey, uh, this guy's got a great voice. And so initially the compare flares up and oh man, I, I don't sound like that dude. Oh, geez. My, my voice is all squeaky and I'm spazzy and polls like this and delivering. And it's just like, wow. Thou shalt not anything. Yes. And then, uh, Paul, I hear Paul's story and I'm like, I got to meet this guy. I just resonate. I remember stopping the car and scribbling notes and I'm just like, man, I got to connect with this guy. And it just so happened that a friend of mine had already reached out to Paul and said, Hey, you need to connect with this money guy. I didn't know this. And so I was reaching out to another channel. I think I cyber stalked him and I'm like, Hey, Paul, I heard this episode and you're so amazing and we got to connect and da, 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 da. And I emailed him like two or three times, didn't hear anything. And I was like, oops, I think I, you know, a little too much fertilizer on the flower, right? Just ended up killing it. And then lo and behold, Paul called back or emailed back. Hey, so-and-so said we need to connect. And I was like, oh, hush, I'm in it, we got in. And so uh, we've been connected ever since and watched Paul's journey of greatness and watched him uh, rise from a good marriage to a great marriage, rise to greatness in parenting, and again, leave the great uh, outer rim of Dagobah and move to Tatooine and enjoy multiple sunsets and enjoying his time in Arizona. So that's our, our quick story connected by podcast. So who knows who's going to get connected on this? Yeah, well... I, I appreciate the long lineage of relationships that can be developed over time and the many places that can take a person. Now, uh, that has taken you across Paul's journey of launching Emissary Publishing, where we tell the stories that matter. Uh, and you have published many books, an above average number of books, shall we say. Yeah, and as, in regards to numbers, that's actually what it was. The um, as an ADD visionary, Enneagram Seven with the Hard Wing Eight, I'm big picture and non detail visionary, and hunkering down to actually write a book is one of those. Oh yeah, that'd be great someday, but um, or you know, hey, I'll just get somebody to to ghostwrite it for me, but. Uh, so writing a book really wasn't on the radar, but what kind of got me over the edge when I started thinking more and more about it, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I could write a book. And um, just as I was reading the nonfiction and the more I read the different books, I'm like, man, I could write this kind of a book, but there's always that block. And what got me over, Jason, was the number of understanding. I heard another famous author share this and he said, over 90% of the people buy a nonfiction book, never get past the first chapter. And I was like, ah, oh. and that was this relief for me. Cause I'm like, oh, well, 90% of my audience isn't even going to read what I wrote anyway. So <laughs> as, long, as long as I could like lock in on the first chapter, I'll be good. Like, and that's what got me started. Cause I was like, Hey, I know I can write a good one chapter. 
and 90% aren't going to read it afterwards. And what I've discovered, this is something that I subsequently trademarked and you can send the royalties this way, but I, I too have some other friends that I've coached on the side as far as authoring. And what I tell them to do is I say, hey, sneak something into your audience, again, for nonfiction, around chapter eight or nine that says something like, hey, guess what? You know, only 5% of the people ever get this far. Congratulations. And um, so in, in my seminars, some of the things I do, I call it the 5% club. So I said, hey, all you 5%ers, you know, the 5% club, you can come meet me over here and we'll talk. And so I know those are the people that have actually finished the book. So we can have a direct conversation. So that, yeah, the numbers is what got me to write the first. And then once I wrote the first, I was like, well, I've got more stuff in me. And this goes back to that budding author, just some encouragement to help people understand, I believe that all of us have a book inside of us. Mm -hmm. The question is, are we going to let it out or not? And most people suppress it and yeah. they make up great excuses. And, you know, speaking from experience, well, we're all loyal to our limitation. So it was about, hey, how do we get unloyal to my limitation and say, you know what? These are people just like me. These are people that wrote a book and you know what? I can do it too. And they're not going to read it anyway. So it's okay. And so that's what got me going and kept me going. And then my last book was, was the biggest hurdle for me because that one, there was a lot of limitation. There was a lot of self-talk doubt and you can't write this kind of book and what's going on. So my last book that I put out is called The Dysfunctional Messiah. And it's an interesting journey about Jesus and all the dysfunction that surrounds him. Mm. Because so often in our faith walk, for my faith walk, it's always like, oh, I could never live up to that. And I'm, you know, I'm too far gone and all this stuff. And then I just started looking at the lineage of Jesus and realizing, because I come from a normal dysfunctional family, but the ultimate dysfunctional family were all of the lineage of Jesus. And so, again, it took me a while to convince myself to put it out, but I was like, hey, you know what? There's enough scholars that put out dry, like scholarly type books. I'm like, you know what? We could use a conversational book about this topic. And so once I got unloyal to my limitations, that was the last one I put out and was thankful that I did. What I hear in all of that is that even a person who writes many books still hears in their head all the ways they can't say this, they shouldn't say this, which I think that some people, when they embark on the, the writing journey and think, man, I'm, I, I'd like to write this book. They think they're the only ones <laughs> who are struggling with this. And then somehow somebody who's produced a lot of work, you know, they don't have that issue. You know, you are not like me, Evan, you don't know the troubles I've seen when in fact you have just determined, I love what you talk about. Uh, you're going to be not you know, un, uh, less loyal or not loyal to your limitations. Absolutely. Yeah. The, it's hilarious how selfish people can be, right? And just like, no, no, no. It it's hilarious because when it's as a, as a coach, I, I coach high end CEOs, I coach nonprofit leaders. And it's so great because I can spot other people's limitations a mile away. Right. And it's like, oh my gosh, look, man, just do this. this. But when it comes to my limitations, it's like, wait, wait, you don't understand it. Like, hold it. Mine are different. <laughs> Mine are special. <laughs> like, oh, this is over here. So I think every author, uh, and I'll use, uh, uh, someone from Paul's former solar system, but I had a buddy up in Washington. He wrote a book called the power of the second thought. And just this concept was, was so brilliant of like, you know what? 99% of the time, the first thought that comes to your head about anything isn't really going to serve you. So mm -hmm. when that guy cuts you off in traffic, when your kid back talks to you, when someone's doing whatever, your first thought is not like, oh, how can I love and serve today? Right. It's something else or, Hey, I want to write this book or, Hey, I want to do this or, Hey, well, I need to call this emissary publishing guys. The first thought is like, nah, right. So it's letting that first one go by not attaching any should shame or guilt or judgment to it. And then being able to have a second thought ready to replace that with. Mm. I think that's the power of this show. What you guys are doing is, you know, there's a, obviously a thread to all these different authors. And it's like, wait a minute, how many different authors do I need to listen to, to realize that, gosh, I could do this too. Yeah. And clearly if that Evan Money guy can write a book, surely I can do something. So 
this thread of just helping people understand. And then that could be a great second thought. So anytime you have that fear, shame, guilt, doubt, you have a second thought ready to replace that with and to focus on that. And just instead of stewing on that first one, it's just let it go by and have a second thought ready to replace that. I'm like, hey, you know what? I can do this. Hey, this is possible. Hey, look, I've got support here. That's what I love about you guys. Like me, I was stumbling, fumbling, bumbling. And, you know, the more I talked to Paul, I was like, man, it would have been so much nicer to work with you on some of my book. Now I got to get a lot more of that. Uh, it would have been so great. Uh, and with that, it's also, again, just understand that everybody's different at a different spot. So mm -hmm. some people may need just encouragement. Mm -hmm. Other people may need like, dude, my adjectives suck. You know, Paul, help me out. Like, help me out to say this better. And the last thing I'll say on this, another thing that really helped me, and I appreciated this transparency. So I like to carry that forward and be over transparent. But the, the great John C. Maxwell has written, I don't know, 50 books now or something insane like that. But early on, he would always, he was always up front. He would always talk about in his speeches and all this. He would always talk about his writer. I believe it was Charlie Wetzel. Yeah, my writer, Charlie Wetzel, my writer, Charlie Wetzel, my writer, my writer. Now, Charlie's name is not on any of his books. John doesn't get any royalties, but John was always up front about saying like, hey, man, it's a team effort. Like, it's not just me and my yellow pad. Like, he's old school. He's got the, the pad and pen and does all, you know, still does all that. But he was right up front, you know, letting everybody know, hey, look, I got a writer. I got a guy that helps me shape this. I got a guy that helps me bring this message across. So, yeah, everybody's got a book in them. Everybody's got a message in them. And again, what I love about you guys is you're there to support in different ways and it's not a cookie cutter approach. And the more support you have, the better the book turns out to be. You know, I was thinking, uh, Jason, as, as Evan was talking there about the second thought back to what originally brought us together, because of course, um, Ev, you don't know this about Jason, but it's one of his, <clears throat> one of our favorite stories to share with people is that, uh, you know, he had, he had wrestled for nearly 10 years to write his first book mm. and numerous starts and stops, you know, get through three, maybe 5,000 words. And then just is what I'm saying even matter. Does anybody, is anybody going to care? You know, all the things that authors usually go through. And then there was, you know, this, this moment where, you know, he took a risk working with somebody who had just a little bit more experience in that area was qualified to encourage and, and also to say, you know, this part needs to change or it needs to be moved or we should just cut it. And it was, it was, that was the big thing that, that sort of forged our partnership was the whole experience of, of helping me, helping him to create. And, you know, at the end of it, right, he would, he'd never got past three or 4,000 words. Now he was at 60,000 words. You know, it was, a, it was a huge jump and it's, it's reflective of what happens <clears throat> for authors when they decide, particularly with the help of someone to whom they're accountable, someone to whom, with whom they're working on an ongoing basis that say, I know what I feel at first, but I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm going to keep pushing through it. And I really think, you know, for the author who follows through, you need to be able to do that. And more, and, 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 and in most cases, not all, but in most cases, it's, uh, having someone else to uh, hold you to that as with each step, as you go down the road, uh, makes it vastly easier. I think I've found the same thing, like in the gym, I work with a, with a trainer now and I'm making enormous progress, but I wasn't working with a trainer for the last two or three years. And I was just stagnant. You know, I, I showed up and I stayed in shape and I wasn't getting out of shape, but neither was I making any gains, nothing measurable. And so the presence of somebody who knows what they're doing, who you're collaborating on that project with is tremendously important. I suppose I'm supposed to respond to that. <laughs> well, no, actually, the more thing you can do for the audience right now is just sit here, all three of us, and stare blankly into the camera. <laughs> I participate in the greatness. Okay. Let me, uh, yeah, let me respond to that, I guess. The, uh, for me, I think the last one is recognize your limitations. Wherever you feel resistance, 
The answer sometimes is not pressed through. Sometimes the answer is who else has been here before? Yeah. And in my experience, the process of writing was hampered by my uh, need to determine whether what I was saying was valuable. Okay. That's not something I can determine in myself. And in fact, the pattern is that I will determine that it's not so valuable because it was valuable until I figured it out. And then I was like, all right, well, that makes sense. And then I moved on. Now, what of that process, what of all of that thinking should be shared with other people? I don't think everything. Uh, and so it was helpful to have Paul to be able to bounce ideas off of so he could help me see what was valuable and I could uh, adjust my own, um, my own barometer, how much, when was the pressure too great? When was the pressure too little? When did I say too much? When did I say too little? Right. That it, I needed somebody outside of that process, outside of the process that existed in my own head to offer new input, which I think is important. Now I know that because I know me. The other thing was that there are just some technical parts that it was just, it was easier to have somebody, it was more reassuring, not easier. It was more reassuring to have somebody just say, here's what's coming next. This is the process. So I didn't have to make it up. And that, that I thought was very, very helpful. Now, from the writing perspective, I can write, I can speak. I've done lots of it. The coherence from one thing to the next over such a long work because i think you know a book is a long it's a long work right mm -hmm. um the coherence how does it all hold together was something that i was like okay i need i need at least somebody to to bounce this stuff off of uh because if i'm left to my own devices i'm gonna i know again knowing me i'm gonna overcomplicate this mm -hmm. i will eventually get in and go is this exactly what is at play here? And then all of a sudden, now I'm on a research expedition and I'll be 80 if the, if the book ever gets written. And, and knowing that about myself, right, meant the only way this is going to happen is if I invite somebody else to the table, somebody who can uh, work me through those resistance points uh, because they're not difficult for him. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing I'll... Well, you sharing that reminded me, this is something I encourage other current and soon to be authors with, and I've seen it on, on both sides is I like to equate, you know, you talk about your 80 year potential 80 year journey. Uh, and that's classic. I'm sure you guys have read the, the war of art, which mm -hmm. is, you know, the, 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 the premise is like, okay, if you give a sculptor, Hey, here's a hundred grand. I need this sculpture done in six months. In six months, it'll be done. If you give the sculptor a hundred grand, say you got three months, in three months, it'll be done. It's like whatever time frame, you know, they understand like, hey, but the traditional artist, if he didn't have a, a time frame, it, he could be sculpting for the next 50 years, you know, Michelangelo style, right? Like, no, yeah. it's not done. It's not. And I have a good friend and also a, uh, actually great spectacular friend he's in the music world and he's done a lot of uh, famous film scores that movies that all you have, you guys have seen and your audience has seen and he shared that with me he said you know what sometimes that time limit is the greatest inspiration ever because yeah. if i have a client that calls me and says hey you got four weeks to produce this music hey at the last day i deliver if he tells me two weeks the last in two weeks i can do the same amount of work <laughs> project. but having that creates that and that was one one tip of like oh and so when i tell all authors i'd love to get both of your guys' thoughts on this and um but it is proven true in in my world is that i tell every author a book is like a baby you got nine months or less yeah. and the baby doesn't come out bad things happen so i've got friends, mentees, colleagues, right? They're, they're on their fourth, fifth year with this book. And it's like, man, if somebody was pregnant for five years, that, that baby's dead a long time ago, right? And it's, you know, it's the war of art, right? He keeps wanting to rewrite it. Well, I've grown so much over the last year, I want to rewrite this. And it's like, exactly. So you're always growing. Mm -hmm. 
you're going to want to rewrite every day. <laughs> you know, it's like you got to ship. And then that's, I think, the, the premise of this episode is that's why multiple books came in for me, because it was like, oh, yes, I've grown since I started writing chapter one. And guess what? I can put that in my next. Book. Yeah, that'll help me finish this book. And so I think that that baby, that nine month window is really helpful for me. Of Like, man, baby's got to come out or bad things happen or you just get stuck in that self-doubt or that gross, even the other way. I've grown so much, much I got to shift and change. So I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. And do you guys have a specific time window? How do you do it? Is, is my nine months pretty accurate? Let me know. Well, I was super encouraged because when I started working with Paul, he set the timeline of 12 weeks. Ooh. And I thought, all right, did some math on it. I thought I can produce the required number of words. There's, there is in fact enough time. What I didn't, uh, what I was not expecting was the process of writing this book was very contrary to the process of a much, a lot of other things I've done in business. You know, most of my business stuff is I've got a target I'm shooting for. I whiteboard the whole thing. And then we just, you know, forge ahead. Now I came up with an outline for the book and then, but I was like, I got, I'm not certain this outline is right. Now I could have got stuck on the outline part of it, or I could just start writing. And the process that I went through with writing was a whole lot less of whiteboarding and figuring this stuff out and a whole lot more of waiting to feel what I wanted to write. And when I felt like I didn't know what to say, I would go for a walk. And then I would, I would kind of feel like, oh, wait a second, I would have a thought and I go, oh my gosh, that's the thought. That's the, that's the one sentence I want to get to. And I would go back to my home office and I would write three, 4,000 words. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I wanted to say. So it was a whole lot of hurry up and wait, which I was not accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Now. I think it was due in part to the content of that. The content of my book was a lot of stuff in me that needed to get out rather than stuff that's in my head. And it's like, well, I can push this out. But I, I think accepting that the process was not, was unlike other processes I've had mm. I have followed mm. helped me get that done mm. in the 12 weeks. Mm. I was on the money. That thing was mm. done, but I allowed for the process to change and, and, and followed a different process with here was key with weekly accountability yeah yeah i'll touch on that real quick and then paul i want to hear from you one one thing i did in my my journey was uh to help me get accountable to myself was i would say hey i'm gonna i, I laid out specific times for me to write and i said the goal is at least one keystroke i i need to touch it somehow, some way. So whether I changed a word, added a word, put a sentence, you know, did a whole 3000, like there were some days where, right, I wasn't feeling it, whatever, but I would go through it and I would change a word and I'd be like, okay, I touched it. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I added two words. Hey, as long as I touched it and I discovered for me that as soon as I, for me, I, I didn't do it at my normal work desk. I would do it on a laptop. And actually right behind me, I've written a few bestsellers on that couch, right? Um, where I sit on the laptop and say, all right, let me touch it. And just by getting there and touching it, all of a sudden, all these channels open mm. where if I was sitting at my desk or doing somewhere else, the channels will be closed. So I love what you shared, Jake, about the walk, right? Like you're taking a walk. I'm saying, hey, this new channel comes in. It's like, all right, let me add that. So for me, one thing of being accountable was like, hey. I just have to touch it. I'm accountable to touching it. And when I touched it, great things happened because to normally one keystroke, keystroke led to two, led to three, led to a few thousand words, led to a new idea. But just the actual, you know, get consistency and that accountability. So that's how I did it with myself. But having, again, having a team like you guys would obviously fast forward and improve the results. But again, you guys are in a spot where it's like, hey, this podcast is to help all authors. So sure. if you don't hire MC Publishing, it's okay. We're here to add value yeah. and help all authors. And again, one way to do that, just be accountable to yourself. But you will discover that having someone else knowing that, oh, Paul and Jason, wait for this. I, I can't weasel out of this. Like, I got, got to deliver. And then you start typing the new ideas, come and voila. But um, Paul, what, what do you got? What's coming up for you? 
Yeah. I mean, one of the things I tell people is, uh, you know, I, I set the expectation for authors. There will, there is going to, there is going to be a point in this, in our process where there's, you know, like in back to the future part three, there's a point of no return past which the train has to just keep going. And we're going back to 1985. Right. And, um, <clears throat> up until then, what I tell people is, you know, play with it, mess it or move stuff around, have people read it, show it to, to people you trust, show it to people who are willing to, especially show it to people who appear to be within the target reader demographic, but they don't know who you are or they know very little about you, right? The more unadulterated feedback you can get back, you can get from people that tells you that you're on the right track, the more encouragement you're going to feel from that. But at the end of the day, right, there's a point, there's a point of no return. And what you have to be willing to do is to say, is to say, okay, if I've reached that point, and I've agreed now, okay, now we're going into editing and publishing, then I can always release a second version of it. I can always release a new version of it. I can always release a sequel. I can always write another book where I, you know, tangentially refer back to what I wrote in this one and say, this is how my thinking is now. It's not a, um, it, 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 it's permanent in the sense that once you print it, that's the version you've got but it's not restricted there, right? It's mm -hmm. not like, well, now we can never change it. Now we can never add to it or take away, you know, um, there are documents like that, um, which, you know, all three of us read, but that's, a, that's a, that's a unique one. Um, and, and even he took over 1500 years to write it. So, <laughs> well, um, one of the, one thing other, one other thing I want to mention quickly though, Jay, is that, um, as, as all of that is going on, right. We're telling people, you know, there's, there's a point of no return. Um, there's a process to doing this that is also laid down in the same all time bestseller that I just mentioned. It's the creative process that the creator himself used. And I've taught my, the writers on my team and I've taught authors to use it. And when they use it, you don't, you, you don't need to worry about the timeline because when you segment work into, um, early on, like outlining and deciding what you're going to write about, and then you let your, you let your brain sleep on it and you wake up and you execute the next morning. And this is a bit of a sneak preview of what we're going to teach at our upcoming workshops, right? Um, there's, there's this process that the subconscious mind kicks in. And if you do that and you, and you, and you wake up the next morning, you'll be amazed. And I've seen it happen with myself and with too many other people for it to be a coincidence. It actually is, is much simpler to do, but we have to follow the process that the creator gave us. And if we don't do it, we shouldn't be surprised that deadlines and, you know, just pushing, continuing to move the goalposts out happens to a lot of authors. So that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> One of the things I'd like to uh, get to with you, Evan, is to hear your perspective on writing, editing, and what process like, uh, term releasing. So I've used this to pretty good effect in interpersonal relationships. When somebody has something to say and they're like, I don't know how to say this. The answer is say something and start anywhere. Because many times the thing that we want to say is bound up in our delivery and usually our criticism of our own delivery. I have to figure out the start of this and then I have to figure out what's next. But you know, you have to start someplace and you can say anything after which when you said things, you can figure out, oh, this is what I want to say sometimes and then reformat everything. Talk to me after having written so many books, what is your process like when you begin to write towards an end goal? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's the classic Zig Ziglar adage, and I'll probably evanize this a little bit. You don't have to be great to start, but in order to be great, eventually you have to start, right? <laughs> it's, you know, but John Maxwell said it the best again. That was my go-to guy, right? So John was like, he it put it to me this way, and, and I was like, man, it stuck. 
and is like, well, how do you write books? How do you start writing? How do you do it? He said, I started writing. And to your point, Jason, that was it. You just start writing. But as far as me writing to a deadline, my format, all of this stuff, and uh, it's really about, again, I, we talk about it. My thing is like, hey, the baby's got to come out in nine months. And I'm talking about from, from conception to birth, like in the marketplace, like on Amazon, in these places, right? Boom, that's nine months. But I go back to, okay, that's the worst case scenario. And I find that if I touch it every day, it usually gets done way faster. So that was my formula of just touching it every day and knowing that, hey, baby's coming. And you know what? It usually happens a lot faster. Uh, with that, one thing I just wanted to share in, in closing, because I know our time's wrapping up here, he is one of my favorite stories that actually helps me get over that hump of potential writer's block or, hey, I don't know what's going on, or, you know, even that startup process of like, gosh, is it worth it? It is what I have to say. So book that I wrote that I was the least proud of, and I'll preface it with a fun ADD story. One of my favorite things to do is to read, you know, the big name authors, right? The guys on top of, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the USA Today, or the Malcolm Gladwells, who I got a chance to meet. You know, I call him my hair mentor for those that know Malcolm. Um, but some of these big authors, and I love reading their books and finding typos in their books. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, even the big guys don't get it all right. I'm like, it's okay. But I had a book that I was the least proud of because it was the most simple, it was the shortest, it was the least well-crafted in my mind. And actually, it was one of my most popular books. Uh, my son told me the story. And again, that's something that I always go back to when I start the, the self-doubt journey of. Um, I, I sent a bunch of books with my son. He was living in Florida at the time. And he was uh, coaching at a parkour gym. So it's a bunch of 20-something guys that are, you know, kind of, you know, living that single guy life, right? And they all kind of shared a a one room roommate kind of thing and everybody sleep on sleep bags and and this. And so uh, my my son told me the story on, you know, I didn't prod or anything. He just told me the story one day. He said, yeah, I, I was, I finished reading your book. It's called Money Talks, Negativity Walks. And it was on the table and one of the other coaches was reading it. And he's reading it. And then my son's sitting there and he's talking to my son. He goes, hey, man, this book is really good. And my son said, well, you know who wrote that, right? And he looked on the front of the book and saw, you know, my name. And, you know, obviously money is the last name. It's pretty catchy. And then he like looked down, looked at my son, looked down. He's like, your dad wrote this? (laughs) He was like, yeah. He's like, dude, this is awesome. But what's funny is my target market was not the 20-something parkour coach. But... To know that, hey, it changed this kid's life. And that was the book I was least proud of and least everything about of. And it was like, okay, you know what? Worst case, I got a niche in the 20, early 20s parkour crowd. But Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, I think that to me is really um, too often. We don't get to, when we throw the pebble in the water and the rings go out, you know, the rings don't report back, right? So Mm -hmm. knowing that, hey, just getting this out there, starting the process, just begin writing and knowing that if I touch it all the time, the baby's going to come out, I will give birth to something and who knows where God's going to take it, right? Of like, hey, you don't know. And so uh, that that one is whenever I'm in those self-doubt moments and last fun author story, so oldie but a goodie, but um, he was the founder of uh, one of the most famous churches here in Southern California, and he's written a baz- bazillion books, one of my go-to old school authors. And he's, he said his book the best. Uh, he's like, you can tell when I'm at my lowest point when you catch me reading my own book. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's strange. Like, oh, something's wrong. He's reading his own book. I just thought I'd share that. Uh, hopefully that adds value to your guys' audience. Well, I think it underscores the fact that sometimes we write for ourselves and there are so many people just like us. So if we wrote to encourage ourselves, imagine how many other people need that same encouragement. Yes. Don't, don't discount it. 
and don't uh, critique it so much that you decide never to say what you need to say. Yeah, yeah, and 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 never forget, right? What it, like Jason, you and I have had said this many times, and have you and I have been through it many times, right? What is what is obvious and simple and automatic for you isn't like that mm. for the next person who's coming along. I'm always surprised when I get people <clears throat> who discovered my book or who heard about it from me or from someone else and bought it. And they're raving to me about, you know, something that I share a, a tactic or a strategy or something like, that. and I'm like, I thought everybody did that. You know, I still, even though I wrote the book and even though I know intellectually that that's not true. I, I forget, I'm, I'm always surprised by the fact mm. that there are people out there who don't understand what I have come to understand. And of course I, I somehow I forget that there was a time that I didn't understand it either. I wrote the book because I learned it, not because it was an eight. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's so easy to lose sight of that. It's harder to lose sight of it. Um, when you produce messages in community with people who you know, go the distance and are as committed to it as you are and, and that kind of thing. And that's, that's what we're always trying to be for our authors. So yeah, I love it. Well, um, this has been really good. I, I, I actually didn't know that about you until today. I knew you had written, I knew of two of your books. I didn't know you had that many. And, um, this has been a wonderful perspective, I think for people just to understand that the author who follows through is not usually following, following through on you know, sheer willpower and, and pushing their way through. No, in fact, very often they're, they're kind of in a sling help, almost helpless, but they're being pulled through by the right people. And they're, and they're also working hard ahead of time to create circumstances that make it very easy to make small, but gradual gains so that this period of time that feels, you know, feels quite small actually turns out to be quite large. And usually you get done way ahead of schedule. I think that that's, I think those are, that's very valuable for authors to remember along, <laughs> along the journey. And, and in that spirit, Ev, um, if people uh, want to learn more about you and, um, and find copies of your books, what would be the best place for us to, uh, tell them to go to? Oh, well, other than Amazon, you can just go to heavenmoney.com and there's a lot of fun, life giving information and tons of cool videos. And there's a section for all the books and, uh, you can go through that way, but lots of fun discovery and cool stuff at heavenmoney.com. Fantastic. Good stuff. Well, thank you so much for being on the Emissary, uh, authors podcast. I'm, I know I've got some takeaways that are good, fresh reminders. Uh, that if we have a message to, to tell, we gotta, we have to get, we have to tell the message. Otherwise it's not going to be told. Yes. And just, I appreciate your insight as well of, you know, dealing with again, interpersonal relationships or even clients of, you know, where do I start? Oh, I can't get it out. It's like, well, just start talking, man. Like, <laughs> let's just say something, let's start anywhere. Love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what, that's the time we've got for this uh, new episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast. Uh, Grateful as always for your friendship and taking the time to be with us, Evan. My name is Paul Edwards and my co-host is Jason Todd. You're listening to the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. And we're going to see you on the next episode.